We did a series with our church at the start of the year called Guardrails. And the idea behind a guardrail is if you hit the guardrail, you do less damage than if you hit what's on the other side of the guardrail. So for that driver, he hit the guardrail, smashed up his racing car, but walked out with the sign, I'm okay. And, you know, if we ignore certain guardrails in our lives, men, we will definitely, definitely live with regret. And as a pastor, I don't know if a pastor Matt, another pastor in this room, I believe one of the roles in our, in our, in our lives is to stop you from uh, making or having living with regrets. Our goal is to point you to safety rather than point you to danger. And in Ephesians 5.15, it says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. And as we, as we leave this conference this evening, God wants us to leave with wisdom in our everyday lives. Now, when I was 17, it's about 10 years ago, I was invited to my, uh, it was my 17th birthday, and I was invited with some friends to Newport in Wales. And um, for my 17th birthday, my friend said, would you like to drive my dad's burgundy Ford Fiesta? Well, who doesn't want to drive a burgundy Ford Sierra Estate Fiesta? Sorry, a Sierra Estate, not Fiesta. And we went camping in Newport, and we were parked up, and he said, okay, why don't, why don't you have a drive? So had a little spin around the campsite, had some fun in the, uh, in the, in, in the uh, Sierra Estate, and then as I was walking back towards Ben to give him the keys, I watched the car driving by itself. I'd never been taught that it had a handbrake. And so this car was drifting towards the edge, towards the hedgerow, and eventually stopped in a ditch. Now, Imagine what you say to the insurance company. They say, who is driving the car? Nobody. <laughs> True story. True story. And I want to just focus, I want you to hold that story, I'm going to come back to it, but I want you to hold that story in tension and I want to zoom in on a, a scripture, just one scripture from the book of Hebrews. We're not sure who the writer was, but... All we know is he was challenging a group of new Christians who had recently converted from Judaism to Christianity. And it was a costly decision. They were being persecuted, even killed for their newfound faith. And this is what it says in Hebrews 2 verse 1. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. We do not drift away. I believe that God has done some pretty significant work in over the last 48 hours in our lives, but I believe that this, this final se this session, God wants us to pay careful attention so over the next few hours and days and weeks, Pastor Matt, that we do not drift away from what God has done in this conference. Because like the Burgundy Ford Sierra Estate, the, the, the writer of Hebrews is recognizing that there are many believers who are drifting towards the edge. So he writes this challenging letter. Chapter 1, if, you've, if you know Hebrews, chapter 1 is all about the Father's love. It's all about the grace of God, forgiveness. And it's all about, you know, come to the loving Christ. But in chapter 2, the writer, he pulls no punches. He starts with the word, we. We must pay careful attention. He doesn't use the word you. He doesn't the word, use the word me. He uses the word we. The writer is saying here, we. That includes Pastor Matt, Richard Nash, Pastor John Norman. It includes all of us that we all have the potential, whether you've been serving Christ for 10 minutes or 20 years, we all have the potential to drift away and lose what God has done in our lives. Doesn't matter whether you're a parent, a student, a teacher, a pastor. Our very first lecture at Bible school, 2001, 22 years ago, 
This is what the first lecturer said to us. We, we walked into class, and we were all excited. I was in, moved to a different continent, different country. And the dean of the college, Miss Brett, she got up there and she said this. She said, 40% of you in 10 years won't even be in church. Now, there was probably seven or 800 students in this lecture hall. And we're like, what is she talking about? We've moved countries, we've sold possessions, we've bought airplane tickets because we want to serve God. We're going to do anything. We put our hands in the air and we said, count me in. Yet the very first lecture, the dean of the Bible school is telling us that in 10 years, statistics say the 40% of us won't even be in church, let alone serving God. So we all laughed and shrugged it off. Facebook's an interesting place, isn't it? Because you can look at where people are up to. I would say 40% was quite light. I would say over half the people that I went to Bible school with 22 years ago have drifted away. The passion, the commitment, even the conviction that they once had has gone. People got hurt in church. People got hurt on staff, people lost hope, people got distracted, people suffered, and this is what happened. Slowly, they drifted away. The enemy's plan for your life is one word, drift. I wanna talk for the next few moments on catch my drift. Catch my drift. <clears throat> if we don't catch this, we could spend a lifetime in regret. There are three things to think about when it comes to drifting from this passage. I want you to write these down, especially some of the young youngsters in this room, young adults. I want you to write these three things down. I wish I'd have heard this message at 21. This, is, this, is, this, this can be a life-saving message for you uh, for the future. Number one is this. Drifting always begins without knowing. Drifting always begins without knowing. He says, we must pay careful attention. Careful attention. That car began to drift without me even knowing it was drifting into the hedge. If you write in notes, write this down. Whenever you take your eyes off something, it begins to drift. Whenever you take your eyes off something, it will begin to drift. Our children have been begging us for a dog for months, okay, for years. We haven't given in, by the way. <clears throat> so we kind of reached a compromise that our neighbors have a dog. So we do a little bit of dog sharing. I think I've got a picture. There's my daughter with our... Uh, our neighbors are also the children's godparents. So we call this the god dog. Okay, and so we share Maximus. Okay, so Maximus comes over for holidays. Maximus gets on the bed. Okay, but... The good thing about Maximus is it's like a grandchild. You send it back to its parents. Okay, so they, they're in charge of all the vet's fees. They're in charge. And when we want to go on holiday, we have... We, so, so we have the best of both worlds. Well, a few months ago, Maximus comes over for a Saturday trip to the Norman family. And our kids are like so excited because Max is in the house. I, so I said to the kids, I said, whatever you do, whatever you do, don't take your eyes off Max because he'll run away. Yes, daddy. Yes, daddy. Yes, daddy. It's about an hour later and I see the kids watching a movie. I said, hey, kids, what's happening? I said, where's Maximus? And they look at me. I said, what did daddy say? Keep your eyes on Maximus. And then the hunt begins. For the next 30 minutes, we are out with the torches and we are looking for Max, who we find in our neighbor's garden. Let's just say he's laying some cable, okay? And uh, we had to deal with that. But here's what I realized with Maximus. All I had to do is take my eyes off him, and he drifted. You know what? All we have to do for our health to drift is ready? Nothing. Nothing. If you want your health to drift, stop eating the right things, stop going to the gym. If you want your health to drift, okay, you ever got on the scales and said, how on earth has that happened? 
I'll tell you, because you did nothing. All we have to do for our finances to drift is, all we have to do for our finances to drift is, nothing. nothing. All we have to do for our marriages to drift, men, is, all we have to do for our spiritual lives to drift is, Stop praying, stop reading your Bible, stop coming to church, stop your standing order for your giving. And so drifting is actually, men, our default. Our default. That's why the writer of Hebrews is challenging us as men. I think we all agree that problems rarely sort themselves out. And suddenly we look back and we think, how did we end up there? There's an old story of how to boil a frog, and my French friends down here would be able to probably teach this a whole lot better than me, but if you want to boil a frog, you don't just put a frog in boiling water, do you? If you drop a frog in boiling water, he'll jump out before he's injured, so you put him in a pot of cold water until he's perfectly comfortable. Then you put him on a stove, and little by little, the water gets warm. And it's pleasant at first, like a jacuzzi. And then the frog becomes a little bit alarmed. And then when it's boiling, he says, how on earth did that happen? Your life's a bit like that. Nobody just falls off the other side of a guardrail. It all starts with drift. You think about COVID. Without even realizing it, people drifted from church. Maybe they ended up at another church. Maybe they ended up away from church altogether. Maybe they ended up without faith. And then the problem is now people say, oh, I'll come back to church. And then the sun shines or a friend rings them to play a round of golf or the barbecue is going at the neighbors and suddenly because they've drifted, they don't even realize what's happened. And drifting is so difficult to see in ourselves, but so easy to see in others. You know, the most difficult part of preaching, of being a preacher, is not the hours that I would put into preparing a sermon. In fact, it's not even the nerves that I feel standing up here delivering a sermon. The most difficult part of the sermon, you know what it is? Living it. It's the hardest part. The prep is kind of a bit onerous from time to time. The, the preaching can be a little bit nerve jangling from time to time. But living it, well, that's, that's the difficult part. Making sure I don't drift from it. You know what? Drifting can happen to all of us. All of us can experience it. So I want to just put a few challenges out for men. How, how do I know if I'm spiritually drifting? I want to just some, some, some kind of just recognizables of how, how we know that we're, we're spiritually drifting to help us get us back. Number one is this, and, the, and these are personal to me, but I'm sure that you'll be able to rate, uh, relate to them. I'm, I know that I'm spiritually drifting, number one, when I'm talking about my problems to others rather than to God. I know that there's a drift happening. First Peter 5, 7 says, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares for you. The second, the second way I know that I'm drifting is when I'm spending God out of duty, not delight. So I've, I'm going to God because I have to, because it's the right thing to do as a pastor. It's the right thing to do, not because I want to. The third thing is this, and this is a big one for me, when I know I'm drifting, is when I'm running, not walking. When I'm going too quick, one of the reasons that that car was sliding towards the edge is he, was, he probably took that, that corner a little bit too quick. And when you're going too quick in life, you often begin to drift because you lose focus on the main thing. Matthew 11, 28, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, walk with me, and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. 
I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Beautiful. The fourth, the fourth way I know that I'm drifting spiritually is when I'm watching instead of worshiping. You know, online church, one of the big challenges with online church is we become watchers, not worshipers. We become critics instead of participators. You know how many times we come into church as men and we can be watchers. Who's in church today? Wonder what they're wearing. Who's not in church today? We can become watchers, yet we have this 20 minutes, 30 minutes together where it's so sacred, where we get to lift up holy hands. And you say, well, why does my worship matter? I'll tell you why your worship matters. I want you to hold your hands up. Hold your hands up like this. Every hand in this room has unique fingerprints. They are uniquely your hands. They are the only hands like yours on the planet. So when you lift up your hands, when the worship leader encourages us to lift up our hands, we are lifting up unique worship to God. There is no one that can worship like you. So when we stand there with our hands in our pockets saying, oh, you know, someone else can do this for me. No, 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 God needs your worship because he created you as a unique being to bring unique worship to a living God. But when I am watching and not worshiping, I am drifting. When I am watching, not worshiping, I am drifting. Psalm 63, one, you God are my God, earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you, my whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. That is my prayer for the men of this nation that we would seek after God. I seek you, I thirst for you. You know what, drift by the way, drifting isn't just happening in us, it's happening around us. We look all around at society and society has drifted from the scriptures. Society has drifted from biblical values. You know, I read this article last year, it said the majority of Europe's Christians are now non-practicing. What does that even mean? How can you be a non-practicing child of God? And God has now been replaced in people's language with higher power. People come to our church and they walk out and they said, oh, it's such a positive vibe at Soul Church. And I had a chat with the church a few weeks ago and I said, look, What you're experiencing is not positive vibes only. It's the Holy Spirit. It is the presence of Jesus moving amongst us. We're not coming to church to experience positive vibes or motivation. We're experiencing the presence of God. And so this isn't a higher power. This is God's presence in our lives. We're told that 71% of young people in the UK now have no interest in any form of God or faith. 81% of our population are now pro-choice in regards to abortion. In 2021, 215,000 babies were aborted in the UK. One in 10 young people now are confused about their gender and sexuality. One in 10 young people are confused in this country around gender and sexuality. Nobody suddenly decided to allow these issues of our time into our culture. Here's what happened. We've just drifted there. We've just drifted there. So whenever truth is removed from society, people create their own version of truth and they drift towards it. It's not the millennials or the Gen Gen Z's fault they don't believe in truth. We stopped teaching it. We opted for trendy over truth. Trendy over truth. Because we become so afraid of moral absolutes. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth that leads to life. 
But what's happened in the world is we've been so scared of being cancelled that we've just drifted. We don't want to talk about some of these hot topics. And then all of a sudden, we've got a whole generation that's confused around their gender, their sexuality. And we, how did we end up there? Because we drifted. And now we're waking up and we're saying, how on earth has this happened? It's simply because we stopped speaking about it. We stopped speaking about the truth. You know, when it comes to oil spills, nuclear threats, insider trading, we have no issues. We have no issues about talking about it at all, but when it comes to these other issues, we've taken our finger off the button. I was in a hotel in Cambridge a while back, and I pulled a side table there, and there was a Bible in the room. I was so encouraged to think that, and I rung down and I spoke, and they said that they'd had Bibles in the hotel for, for years, but they've been persecuted now for having Bibles in a hotel drawer. Drifting, drifting, drifting. And so, as individuals, as society, we are drifting towards what is a catastrophic edge. And as men, we have to wake up and smell the coffee of where we're going. The car is drifting towards the cliff edge, and the question is, will men of God stand up for truth? Will men of God stand up for biblical truth on some of these moral issues? Church, we love you too much to watch you drift. I love young people too much to watch them drift. We speak black and white. If you're going to have sex outside of marriage, here's what's going to happen. You are going to drift. That's what will happen. If you look at pornography, as appealing as it is to the eye and to the mind, let me tell you, you will drift. And so we have to talk about some of these issues before it's too late. The dumbest thing we can ever do in life when we're drifting and in culture is ready? Nothing. Because that's what we've done for the last probably 15 years. We haven't really spoken about any of these issues and we've drifted and then we've come back and we say, how on earth did we get there? So I want to challenge us with a question. What areas of my life am I drifting? What areas in my life am I drifting? Second question or second thought around drifting is this. Drifting continues when we fail to pay attention. We must therefore pay most careful attention to what we have heard. We stop hearing the truth. In 2018, I went to Israel with a group of friends. And um, it was a brilliant trip. We, 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 We went to all the holy sites. And then on the, the last couple of days, we went down to the River Jordan to the beach to hang out. And um, this is probably one of the most stupidest things you're going to hear on this conference. But I said to a group of my friends, I said, we were standing on the edge of Israel and we could see Jordan. We could see Jordan just across the, uh, the, 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 the Dead Sea. And I said, we should swim across to Jordan. And everybody said, that is the most stupid thing ever. I said, well, nothing tried, nothing gained. And so it looked about three miles. So I thought, well, we'll we'll give it a go. Everyone said, bad idea, bad idea. And anyway, there was only one person who thought, potentially this was a good idea. So we set off and the sun was shining. I mean, the, the most incredible scenery ever. I was laying back, kicking across the ocean, but I didn't realize that what was happening is I was kicking back instead of going directly across to the Jordan, I was actually just drifting. And I was on my back, just kicking away. I think this is the the, the, the best thing ever. I got so preoccupied by my surroundings, I lost my way. I'm gonna come back to that story in just a second. Because one of the challenges with drifting is we get so busy in life, we stop to pay attention exactly where we're at. 
And I'm so encouraged that so many men, 150 plus men, have come out to this conference because what this has actually done is if you are drifting in this moment, it stopped and it, we're paying attention to exactly where we're at spiritually. And I know God has done some deep work in many of your hearts. You see, divorce isn't an event, it's a process. And the process is called drift. Debt is not a one-off transaction in our life, it is, it is a process called drift. Addictions do not happen overnight. You don't become an addict overnight. It's called drift. And the devil is the king of keeping us so preoccupied that we do not pay attention to how far we have drifted. And as we drift away in our marriages, we drift away in our finances, we drift away in so many areas of our lives, it's not until we suddenly go, hang on, how did I arrive here? In culture, we had warning signs probably 15 years ago with the secular agendas in our schools and our colleges and our universities, yet the church went quiet, we didn't pay attention, and then we suddenly, we arrive here. How did we end up here? It's simply because we did not pay attention to where culture was taking us. And the devil is the king of keeping us preoccupied. You know, we get so busy, the easiest thing with our kids, the easiest thing is just to sling our kids a phone or an iPad. And YouTube is now raising a generation of children. And what they're searching for and what they're finding, we have no idea what's going into their, their small little brains. And then we wonder why they're playing up or they're acting differently in the home. It's because we're drifting. By the way, this message gets better in a minute. Is this helping? I know it's pretty black and white, but I believe if we can arrest some of these things, we can really help ourselves, our marriages, and society. I want to ask us a question on this, on this point. What areas of my life am I not paying attention to that's causing drift? It could be your kids. Oh, they'll, they'll come back to church one day. Oh, they'll, they'll, they'll all come good one day, but we're not paying the attention to them that they need. Our finances, it'll all just come good one day. I'll just keep spending on my credit card. I'll just keep taking out another loan and another loan, and it'll all work out in the end. All things work together for good, and we even quote scriptures over them. Yet God is saying today, we've got to pay attention to the areas of our lives, men, that are drifting. Number three, here's the good news. Drifting can end with a decision. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. I want to just zoom in on that word, away. What is away? Away is basically over the edge. Over the edge and far away. We have to catch the drift before it's too late. I'm about a mile out into the Dead Sea. And I get salt water in my eye. If any of you have ever been in, into the Dead Sea, it's brilliant for scabs on your legs, but it's not so good for the eyes. I, as I got scabs, and I realized that I was probably nearly a mile out and I couldn't stand up either. And I went into what I'm calling panic. My friend had already turned back, and the only thing I could do was scream for help. And I screamed at the top of my lungs, help, help, help. Thankfully, help arrived in the form of a boat and a couple of guys helped me and dragged me back to a very, very large group of laughing friends who pointed out that this was a bad decision at the start. You know, I actually... Drifting ends with a decision. We actually, as believers, sometimes we've got to go backwards to go forwards. Often we think about going backwards as 
as being defeated. I think actually we need to go back to the principles of God's word, back to the authority of God's word, back to godly values. And if backwards, if it means that, you know, people have accused me of backwards teaching, oh, you're not as progressive as you should be on some of these areas, but if it means going backwards to propel forwards, I'm all up for going backwards. If, back, if backwards means lives are being saved, for me, backwards is the new forwards. And I had to go back. I had to learn a really painful lesson and I had to go back to the safe shores of Israel. And now I don't think there's been a more pivotal moment in history where we need to be honest, we need to stand up as men in our homes like Joshua, we need to stand up and recognize the areas we've personally drifted, and we need to be men who have the courage to stand for truth of God's word. I believe that drifting can end, Pastor Matt, in our culture if enough pastors and leaders and people of faith have the courage to stand up and speak the truth in love. You see, it's our decisions in life which determine our direction, our decisions. We don't just have to go. Young men, we just don't have to go <clears throat> with the cultural flow. Everyone's sleeping around. You don't have to. You don't have to. All my friends were sleeping around, but I made a decision I was 16 years old that I was, I was going to be a virgin. I made that decision at 16 years old at a Ron Loose crusade in Atlanta, Georgia. Made that decision. It was the hardest decision I ever made, but I made that decision. I kept that decision to the day I stood in front of my wife and made that covenant with her. And I want to encourage us as young men to keep purity at the forefront of what we do. We don't just have to go with what everyone else is doing. Everyone else is getting drunk at the work party and I'm just going to be one of the lads and I'm going to have as many beers as I can. You can be different. You don't have to be one of the lads. Everyone's sleeping around. Everyone's sexting each other. I'm just going to join in. You're not everyone. You've been bought with a price. You don't have to send a nude picture of yourself to someone. You don't have to do that. And some of you older folk are like, what on earth does that mean? Let me tell you, I won't go into the details, but it's happening. You're a child of the king. You're a son of the almighty God. We can stand up to the cultural narratives of the day with the truth of God's word. Everyone's just accepted evolution as creation. My son came back from school a few months ago and he said, Daddy, did I come from a monkey? He asked me. We taught, we taught him that night. He was only six years old at the time and I taught him. I said, Justice, you didn't come from a monkey. He said, you were born in the image of God. You were fearfully and you were wonderfully made. Marvelous was his work. Your soul knows very well. And I said, I, we teach our young people respectively that when they're taught evolution in school that you can respectively stand up and say, sir or ma'am, that's just your opinion. I believe that I was created by Almighty God. We don't just have to accept what they're teaching in class. We can stand up. We can stand up and proclaim who we are in Him. I'm not going to allow certain teachings into my children. We made a decision. We can either let our children drift into culture or we can make a stand. We made a decision. We're going to pull our kids out of certain, certain classes in school. Because I don't want the secular system of the day teaching my children who they are because I want to teach them who they are in Christ. I'm going to teach my children sexuality. The school system's not going to teach my children. They can teach them biology, but I'm going to teach them sexuality because I want them to know who made them, who created them, and who Christ has called them to be. So we can, e we can either drift, quesera, sera, whatever will be, will be, and hope for the best, 
or we can make a decision to stand for truth and teach the truth in our homes. And I know this is a hard-hitting session, but someone's got to speak. Someone's got to speak up. Everyone's avoiding the H word. Church of England don't want to go anywhere near it. It's called the word hell. I sat with a group of Christians recently. We're talking about the book of Revelation. If you've never read it, it's definitely worth a read. And they, I said to them, I said, so how do you see the book of Revelation? And they said, we believe the book of Revelation is just a poetic dream. Wow. Wow. The word of God is now just a poetic dream. A book that people have died for in their countless thousands is now just a poetic dream. This is not a time to play games. Jesus Christ is coming back again. There is a heaven and there is a hell. That's the H word that I was talking about. That's why the writer of Hebrews, he said, pay the most careful attention. Trendy teaching today says that there are no absolutes. All roads will lead you to Rome. You can get to heaven by being a good person, take your neighbor's dog out for the walk, look after your friends and good works will get you where you need to be. Think, live, act, however way you want to, and friend, it'll all just come good in the end. Sadly, that's not the case. God's word says there is one way. Not five ways, not four ways, not three ways, not two ways. There is only one way to heaven, and that is through God's son, Jesus. Amen. How can you say there's only way, one way to God? Because the word of God says, Jesus said, I am the way. The truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the truth. He doesn't say truth is a religion or a set of rules or regulations. He says I. He says truth is a person. And this is what separates Jesus from every other world religion. Other leaders have said, I'm looking for the truth, I'm teaching the truth. I'm a prophet of the truth. I point to the truth and Jesus comes along and he changes the narrative. He says, I am. I am. There it is again. I am the truth. And it's because I can trust Jesus, I can trust the Bible. Now I want to say something that's really, really probably biblically incorrect, but I'm going to say it anyway, then I'm going to bring context. I don't always agree with the Bible. So when someone cuts me up on the road, the Bible teaches me to turn the other cheek. Now in that moment, do I agree with the Bible? Why would I? Because everything raging in me is wanting revenge. So I'm not asking you to agree with the Bible, I'm asking you to trust the Bible. Men, come with me here. We're not asking you to agree with everything in the Bible. We're asking you to trust it. The Bible is proven over thousands of years and it can be trusted. Does it mean we have to agree with it? Well, I actually don't think it does. It means I trust it. Did I agree with every decision my parents made growing up? No, but I trusted them. And I'm here today because of them. The way, the scriptures, is a steering wheel. And if there is no way, there is no truth. So we have to choose Jesus as the way. And he will lead us into all truth. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The pattern of this world is to drift to drift. Everyone's drifting. But we're not called to conform, we're called to transform. I want to encourage you. I can't transform your life and you can't transform mine, but today you can make a decision. You can make a personal decision that I'm not going to drift. 
I'm not going to allow my children to drift. I'm not going to allow my loved ones to drift. I'm not going to allow my finances to drift. I'm not going to allow my marriage to drift. And I believe if enough men stand up today and say, I refuse to drift, I believe we have a chance to catch it before it's too late. You might have all the best intentions in the world, but unless you make a decision today to stop drifting, you will end up somewhere like I did, halfway across the world, almost could have been catastrophic if someone hadn't come to help me. Today, young men, dads, those in their senior years, you can make a decision to stop drifting. The reason my car crashed right at the start of this story was this, no one was at the wheel. The reason that society is crashing all around us is because we took Jesus away from the wheel. He needs permission. And as a society, we're driverless. Got no direction, and it's leading to devastation in countless numbers of people's lives. But I'm making a decision today as the team come up. I'm making a decision today that Jesus is in the driver's seat of my life. I'm making a decision as I go home to my wife, as I go home to my children, as I go home to my family, as I go back to my church, I'm making a decision. I refuse to drift one more day of my life. I made a decision that I'm going to follow Jesus, no turning back. No matter what culture says, no matter what social media says, no matter what Hollywood says, I know God's word, and I'm determined to live by the truth of his word. I might not always understand it. I might not even always agree with it, but I trust God's word. If you are a man today, and you are saying, I'm making a decision. I recognize that maybe there's areas in my life that I have drifted, but I'm making a decision. On June the 17th, 2023, I'm going to stop the drift. I'm going to arrest the drift. I'm going to make a decision in my life, those around me. It's going to affect my community, society, but I'm going to be a man who stands for God's love, but God's truth. I want you to stand right now.